Okay, so uh, this talk is about standards. Sounds boring, probably is boring. Um, I could have called it fucking standards. Why do they work as a, <laughs> or how does it work? Awesome, all right, so I'm gonna talk about standards, um, setting expectations for what I hope to get through in this probably slightly too short talk. Uh, first of all, why should you care about standards? I think uh, a couple years ago I cared theoretically but didn't know why I should care practically. Um, how exactly does it work and uh, how has jQuery been involved in standards and some success stories? Um, the overarching theme here is standards actually matter, jQuery is involved in them, uh, you should probably be too if you care. Um, so first of all, why should you care about all this? And um, I think it's very tempting to not care, uh, first of all, because there's just declining trust in institutions in general in the world. Um, so the W3C is an institution, so by definition, if you hate Congress, you probably hate the W3C. Um, <laughs> but part of why that happens is that the W3C seems like a somewhat distant organization that doesn't really understand what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'll talk a little bit more about the process uh, later, but the organizations are made up of people, and for example, I am a part of the W3C, so obviously this is not entirely true that it's just a bunch of people sitting in a room uh, committing the next version of, of the web. Uh, I think the most important reason why you should care is that the future is coming, and I think uh, it's very easy to look at what we're doing right now in terms of the last war, in terms of essentially the IE6 stagnation, and I just want to show you some graphs uh, about how browsers have been trending, because uh, after jQuery announced that jQuery 2.0 would not support IE6 and 7 and 8, there was a lot of gnashing of teeth uh, in Hacker News, which I participated in yesterday, and I think people don't really understand what has been happening. Um, I think we tell ourselves a lot of stories about why IE something or other is never going to go away, but that doesn't actually seem true in practice. Um, so first of all, here is uh, Internet Explorer. So here's the browser share of Internet Explorer. Um, many, raise your hand if you started around 2006 or seven, something like that. So like a bunch of people, like a third of the room or something, started around 2006 or 2007, and it's very easy to have been, uh, to feel shell-shocked by what was a crazy thing, right? This, this was like essentially a fluke in the history of the web, and it basically meant that we were stuck with really, really bad browsers making up most of our customers for actually the beginning of most of our, our web careers. Um, and what happened over time, though, is that we know the total share of Internet Explorer dropped, but additionally, specifically, the, the way the versions of Internet Explorer that are being used, you can see that the ones that we don't like are getting smaller. So there's a story that we tell ourselves that, like, IE6 is used in banks, it's never gonna go away. Well, it actually went away. Then we told ourselves like, IE7 was the browser that shipped with Windows Vista, so obviously never gonna go away, right? So we have, we have all these stories. Now IE8 is the last uh, version that works on Windows XP, so now IE8 is never gonna go away. But actually this is not true, right? So this is the structure. So uh, if, you, if I could go back further, if we had good numbers from before, you would see a, uh, a slope, right? This is IE7, right? Went up when IE7 came out, goes down. Um, and now we're sort of in the middle of the IE8 cycle. Right, it sucks, there's still a lot of people using IE8, but I don't see any good reason to believe that it's not going to go down like every other Internet Explorer browser. Um, and here's Internet Explorer 9. So uh, again, Internet Explorer as a whole is going down, and we aren't actually seeing the disaster that we told ourselves, the, the apocalypse of everyone using IE6 forever and ever and ever that we told ourselves was gonna happen in 2007, 2008, just didn't actually materialize, and I think we should stop telling ourselves that story. That, this is not a real story. On the flip side of that, there's a far more complicated story of things that have been happening since. <laughs> uh, so since 90% of the browser market share is Internet Explorer, we have sort of a better, a better story. Um, so this is very complicated, largely because there's a lot of different versions of things. So let's just zoom in on just uh, some specific browsers. So here's uh, Firefox 2 and Firefox 3 in 2008, right? So sort of, it looked a lot like Internet Explorer, actually. Um, now let's go to 2009. You can see Firefox 2 goes away. Firefox 3, 3.5. 3, um, and unfortunately, you can see uh, Firefox was sort of hanging on in the same way that Internet Explorer was hanging, hanging on. Um, and now you move forward to 2010, and you can see why you might be getting a little bit pessimistic. 
uh, Firefox 3.6 is here, Firefox 3.5 is still hanging on. Um, but as you move forward, actually that has stopped being a thing. Um, Firefox, the older Firefoxes have gone away. 2011 and 2012 were basically up, up, and away um, on new browsers. We've basically killed everything that's not Internet Explorer that has this weird long cycle, but not a interminable one. Um, we've basically gotten onto the fast path. So basically, in the world of browser, people that use browsers, there's basically two groups of people. There's people that are on the slow tail, which today basically means you're using Internet Explorer. It used to mean you're using Internet Explorer or Firefox, but today it basically means you're using Internet Explorer or maybe like a really old version of Firefox, or maybe you're on the Firefox slow upgrading path because you're on the like LTE thing that they're doing. Um, so there's some percentage of people that are on the slow tail. And more and more people are on the fast path. And the fast path basically, it doesn't mean, oh, you're using Chrome so you get better features. It also means that you get better features all the time, right? So there's, there's actually like a vast wilderness in between the slow tail and, the, and the, the fast path, right? The people who are on the fast path are pulling away at a fast pace and the people who are on the long tail are still stuck. Um, the good news is that the slow tail is shrinking all the time. So Internet Explorer, for example, has gotten themselves more into the fast path lane, and all the time more into the fast path lane. Um, and so there's, there are some people still in the slow tail, but we can see the, slow, the whole concept of a slow tail shrinking, shrinking all the time, getting smaller. And we can see that the cutting edge, which was basically 0% in 2006 when a lot of us started, is now becoming the dominant story of the web, right? So in terms of trends, we're going from everybody's on IE6 to most people are on the cutting edge. And the cutting edge itself is speeding up. So the cutting edge, like I said, Firefox moving slowly, Firefox now, fast path, Chrome fast path. Um, Safari, maybe not super fast path, but definitely not like IE slow, right? So that's, that's why you should care. I think if you, if it's easy to get discouraged by the past, but if you look at the trends, it's pretty clear that the trends are in the right direction. And again, I don't, I think we should stop telling ourselves the stupid stories about nobody will ever get off XP. XP is like 15 years old. It, this is not actually a real thing. I mean, so, so it is. There's, there's, there's banks that still use XP, but eventually even bank, like, eventually Microsoft will stop offering support for, for XP. And I think, I, I think if you talk to Microsoft people, they, they think that the entire era where they created this slow tail was like a big epic mistake. And they, they are happy to get it past them just as much as we are happy to get it past them. So, uh, so standards, how do standards work um, in general? So, I, this slide I have here because I think I, uh, there was this talk by Zed Shaw about why the W3Z sucks and it's like a vaudeville act of people throwing banana peels or whatever. Um, and I think the only way to really believe that it's a vaudeville act of people throwing banana peels is if you don't know like who actually is in there. Um, so for example, uh, most, uh, most of the people who participate in standards discussions are implementers. So the Chrome team is there and the Firefox team is there and the IE team is there. Um, and Opera is there, actually, so <laughs> quite actively. Um, so there was a comment on Zed's post that was like, standards committee should not be the ones who get to decide the future or invent the future. So actually, the people who get to invent the future are the browser vendors, largely, and they're the ones who are in the standards body. So um, trying to, in your head, separate those two things is, is silly. If you like Chrome, you probably like at least some of what the W3C is doing because they're the ones who are doing it. And, I th and increasingly, um, Implementers were a, a sort, it's sort of a trade organization, so implementers are who started the process. Um, but increasingly, people like me, um, people like Rick Waldron, uh, people, uh, Alex Russell was sort of the pioneer of this when he was doing dojo work. Um, increasingly, people like me are getting involved in the process. Uh, the process is actually some, it's pretty uh, meritocratous. It's pretty do work and you get, and you get to do, you get to have a say. Um, unfortunately, a lot of us don't have as much time as we would like to participate, but if you do have the time, if you're willing to sink the time in um, for whatever reason, you will probably be met with uh, people being happy that you're there. I think one of the biggest questions that, it, that is a question in the standards discussions that makes it hard for us to see what exactly is going on and makes it easy for us to say like this is a complete waste of time is the question of whether there should be new sugar or new primitives. Um, so historically, the browser vendors have been very, very, very tilted in the terms of new pr in the uh, space of new primitives. Give new primitives, give you know a DOM API, and then if 
library vendors want to do stuff, they'll go and implement whatever needs to be done. There's increasingly an argument that's gaining currency, which is um, at some point throwing a megabyte of JavaScript at everything is not really tenable for the web. And so we need to actually have, take a look at what exactly is in the megabyte of JavaScript that everyone's shipping and figure out what of it we could put in the platform. And so I, I would say historically primitives have been the way to, have been the way in overwhelmingly the standards bodies have tilted. More recently, uh, there's gaining currency for higher level, higher level stuff, basically based on the fact that we've all been doing this for a while now and we have a sense of some of the things that we need. The W3C process is consensus driven. Consensus means everyone has to agree. This means that things can be slow, but it means that when you get agreement, everyone actually implements the thing. This is actually a good idea. Um, if the alternative is that a few browser vendors get to make features that other browser vendors are vehemently against. You push the standard through, then IE or Opera or Firefox or Chrome hates the feature and doesn't get in. This is actually not a better, people want this, but it's not actually a good idea. It actually, believe it or not, it's actually important for IE to be, have veto power over what happens in the standard. Um, and then again, workers, I should actually, <laughs> so veto power is, is like the, like, nuclear weapon of consensus driven process. And most consensus driven processes don't work like that, right? So um, I think it's important that everyone has to get on the same page. Uh, and then finally, in general, these processes are driven by workers who are, who are doing things and not by talkers. So there usually are talkers who are saying a lot of things and if you like look at the public lists, it seems like they're having a lot of currency, but actually the people who write the spec and who shepherd the spec and who respond to bugs and um, who get things implemented at have significantly more currency than people who are just talking. Um, there's so, sort of an exception for that. If an author comes, author is like the terminology for us. Um, so if an author comes to a standards body and says like, this feature you're implementing doesn't really work for me and people like me, uh, typically that will have some respect, but actually doing work is more important. Okay, uh, process. So. W3C process, if you like start getting involved, there's a lot of weird acronyms, um, but it's pretty, it's not that complicated. There's basically a bunch of steps that something goes through. There's a working draft, which basically means like, we, we don't really have, we don't really know what's going on. We're just experimenting, we're putting something together. Maybe there's like an implementer who's, who's like pushing it through. Um, there's last call, which is basically, okay, we now have a spec, we think it's good. Anybody have any objections? Are implementers happy with this? Um, and then it goes from there to either candidate recommendation or proposed recommendation, which is basically based on whether or not there are already implementations. So um, there's like, there's a process for this, but basically if there, if you need implementations, you go into uh, CR. Um, I actually don't remember the exact, I should have made a, a, a flow chart. But basically you, you walk down the, you walk down the process until you get to web standard, which is th stuff like HTML4, DOM3, Selectors3, stuff that we think of as web standards. I think the important thing to do, the reason I put the list of actual specs on the right side is that there actually isn't really a strong relationship between where you are in the W3C workflow and how much implementation there is. So for example, HTML5 is in the working draft section uh, together with Shadow DOM, which is basically completely unimplemented, right? So um, it's not really, you can't go and look at like, oh, what's the status and understand what's going on. You have to sort of have a bigger sense of where the standards are in terms of the implementation. So uh, the reason why there are all these steps is that there is a feedback process. By far the best place for a web author or a web library developer to provide feedback is in the working draft period, which is basically like, okay, we're in the middle of developing something. Uh, everyone's discussing, you come up and you say like, hey, you, you, know, you made a mistake. If you do this, it's foreclosing all these things that developers wanna do. Um, Last call is also an okay time to provide feedback. Last calls have deadlines though, and typically people think that the spec is mostly baked, so if you come in in the last call and you're like, this is a stupid idea, why are you doing WebGL? Probably everyone will be like, get out of here. Um, and then it goes to candidate recommendation or proposed recommendation. It's actually totally fine here to like, su suggest tweaks, but if you're, again, if you're off suggesting like whole, like you guys got it wrong, be pretty sure that you know what you're talking about. Um, the people who actually work on these specs are smart and have worked through implementation details. And if you just come in off the street and say like, in like a, a CR or PR period, like, hey, you guys suck, probably people will not respond well to it. Okay, so basically the short version is like, if you wanna be involved, try to be involved earlier because there's more opportunity to affect the outcome than trying to be involved later. 
Um, pretty much all the important discussion that happens during the year happens on mailing lists. Um, the ones that I think are the most important if you wanted to subscribe to a bunch would be public web apps, public HTML, and WWW style. Um, so these are just like people who are interested in standards. It's literally just discussions about standard after standard. So it might be interesting or not to you. Um, I put ES discuss in parens not because it's less important, but because I don't really, I'm not really talking about JavaScript in this talk. Um, although basically the same things apply minus the specifics of the process. So now that I've talked about how it actually works and how you should participate, I want to talk about uh, complaints that people have. So this is again Zed's talk. This is everybody loves grids. Why don't we have a grid? Um, so that's basically a short version of like layout sucks. And this is the sort of thing where like everyone, almost everyone who watched Zed's talk was like, that saying to me, I understand you made the point. It was awesome, great. It, you are like the first person who has said what I believe. Um, and actually most people do believe that like the web is a stagnant thing that has no features and nobody's making progress and what the fuck is going on. And actually, no. So actually almost any complaint that anybody has is being actively worked on. So <laughs> for example, you want a grid? Okay, there is a spec for a grid. It's being actively worked on. It's been working on for over a year. If you want, to pr if you want a grid a lot and you think you have something to add to the topic, please participate in the discussion. Uh, then like, this is another one which I think is relatively popular. <laughs> it's like, oh my god, why do I have to do mar margin auto left clear, whatever, uh, seems terrible. Um, and actually, okay, we, people know about this problem. And this spec was started being worked on in 2009 based on a thing that was in Firefox for like a decade. And here's how you center stuff using Flexbox. It's not actually that complicated. Um, and I think, again, I think obviously because of the fact that we're all still working with Internet Explorer, there's basically two concerns being con uh, conflated here. There's the concern like, it sucks, I can't use any of these new features because I still have to support IE. And then there's, for some reason, people go off the rails and, like nobody's working on anything. Actually, no, people are working on stuff. And it is, does in fact suck that you're not working on IE, but nobody in the world, unless you have a time machine, can actually go back and fix the fact that IE6 doesn't have Flexbox. So what we should be doing is dealing with that by you know, getting people on the fast path. You, projects like Chrome Frame are helping with that. Um, but what we should be doing if we're upset at the W3C for not doing things is we should look at to see what they actually are doing and then we should see what browsers that are part of the W3Cs are implementing. So for example, Flexbox actually is relatively widely implemented. Um, you might be upset at IE for not, for not supporting it. That's a valid thing to complain to them about. Uh, but the point is, it works today in Chrome, right? Like, is it the, the, I use these two examples because I think they have wide currency, like this is broken, W3C should be working on it. Pretty much every single thing that you think is important, somebody is working on, there's an active spec for it. If you care a lot about something, go participate in the discussion. Um, that should say implementers. Uh, I just wanna say, if you, again, if you like what Chrome is doing, Implementers are the standards bodies. I actually really enjoy working with the Chrome guys. So the Chrome guys are on all these, on these committees, and my involvement in the committees is all, is is pretty heavily tilted towards working with existing implementers, including people on Chrome, to get specs done. And I think most importantly, the guys who are working on these things actually really want our feedback. So they spend way too much time trying to figure out how to get our feedback. It would be a lot easier if we all just went and gave it to them. Um, probably not all of us, but more of us involved in libraries and people who have time. Um, so that's, that's the like, why can't I center shit? Um, and just, just, I only had 40 minutes. Pretend I went and went through like every single complaint and showed you a spec for it because I could do that. Okay. And the last thing I wanna do is just talk about some examples of stuff we've been doing. So uh, all the stuff that I said up until now is stuff I've believed for a while. And part of my, what I've done with the jQuery Foundation over the past year or so is get the jQuery Foundation to be real official members of the W3C and the ECMA so that I can actually go together with other people on the jQuery Foundation who are interested in these topics and participate in the face-to-face -face discussion. So everything happens by email for the most part, but then there are a few face-to-face -face discussions which are obviously somewhat important, you wanna be there. Um, so uh, I wanna talk about two things that we did um, basically uh, through the jQuery Foundation to help make standards that are going to be helpful. So the first one is, um, we did not make query selector all, that's a pretty old spec at this point, believe it or not. Um, but it's actually broken. 
Uh, query selector all is broken. So everybody who says like, I don't need to use jQuery, no problem, I'll just use query selector all. Unfortunately, if you look at the query selector all implementation in jQuery, there's a bunch of work to get around bugs. Um, unfortunately, uh, these problems were known to the people working on the feature at the time because John told them about these problems and they said, we'll get it in selectors too. So in fact, we are getting it in selectors too, but as as could have been predicted, there has been a very long time where there's selectors one without selectors two, where we have to live with the bugs. So that sucks. Um, but I think we're we're making we're making things better now. So here's here's a bug in query selector all. So you have a div, grandparent a p which is a parent, a span which is a child, and you say, okay, give me the parent, and then give me all the div spans under that. Almost everybody I know thinks that the correct answer here is that it's no element. Basically, that the Second query selector all is pretends that the root is the, the p. Um, it's how jQuery works and every other selector engine that exists works. But the way this actually works in the browser is that it basically does, it finds all the spans that match div span that are inside of parent. So it actually matches that span because it is a div span from the, rep, from the perspective of the entire document. What this basically means is that jQuery could not just simply drop in query selector all. We have to do a hack where we add a uh, synthetic ID onto the element and then do a query against that. And then also deal with like what happens if you have commas and stuff like this. So this is not good. And obviously there are limitations when you have like colon not and stuff like that. So not, not a good situation. Um, this is my email box around the time where we were discussing it. Uh, so you can see on the bottom, QSA, the problem with scope and naming. You can see 100 next to that. Then you see re, <laughs> re QSA, the problem with scope and naming, 36. Anyway. Um, so Lots and lots and lots of emails uh, starting in October 2011. But the good news is ending in December 12, 2011 with proposed specification for find, find all matches. Um, this is a good thing. This is a good thing. It means that we have actually successfully gotten the W3C together with a lot of browser implementers who were very interested in fixing these bugs to have a spec that actually matches the behavior that people will expect. Um, this is like one of the early things that I, that w I said about this, which you can see the example up there. My face, I, talk, I talk to a bunch of people. Nobody thinks this is the correct behavior. Um, so this seems obvious. I think um, one of the sad things about standards is that everyone thinks like, oh, obviously that's wrong. Just fix it, right? Like any anytime just is at the beginning of a sentence, you know bad things are happening. Um, so at the time I said like, I think the punishment for like screwing up a, a spec should have to be that you're, the next time you do it, you have to use a shorter name. So. So we got find and find all because, so now we don't have to worry about query selector all. Anyway, there's a, there was a lot of issues. Like there's a new feature which lets you have a CSS style that is scoped to a particular element. How does that interact with this? What if you actually use colon scope, which is a CSS4 feature, which lets you um, basically, which lets you uh, have a selector against the current scope? Um, what should we name this? Should we name it find, find all, or something else? Uh, what about uh, match a selector, which is basically a companion for this, which jQuery also uses? How does that work exactly? What are the semantics? Um, there was a long conversation in the middle, like why don't people just use XPath, um, which we have to actually get through, because that's how the consensus process works. Um, there's a question of combinator, so this doesn't actually make sense from the perspective of CSS. You're like finding child div, like what does that mean? But everyone, everyone intuitively knows that it makes sense, so we have to describe a mechanism for making it make sense. Um, and then like what should it return? Should it return an array or a node list or a static node list or whatever? So there's all these discussions that happen when you open these can of worms that you have to get through. You have to actually get to the end. You have to, you don't, you don't get, basically what happened wrong with, with selectors one is that we went in and we said like there is a bug and then we left. And everyone said okay, cool story and moved on. You have to actually walk through the 100 messages, the 500 messages or whatever. Um, so you can see here, for example, they were like, here's a bunch of edge cases. How does it work? And I basically, like, I guess it works like this. And I basically was like, here's a JS fiddle with how jQuery does it. Here's the answers. Um, here's how combinators work in jQuery, right? Uh, so I basically went through and walked everyone through, like, what was happening in jQuery. And I think basically this is how we should be uh, looking at the standards process is, we already, we basically have a bunch of stuff that we do ad hoc on the web, and it's very easy to say like, just make jQuery the DOM API. But jQuery does a lot of things ad hoc um, based on bugs that were submitted. We have to actually make it make sense in the language of the standard. We have to make it make, be coherent. There's a lot of things that are incoherent about jQuery just because of how it was built over time. So figuring out, like basically creating a formal way of understanding what it means to have a combinator at the beginning was 
very important, and we have to actually get all the way to the end. So that's one uh, success story I think we got a spec in that is going to be good. If you, it's actually good for people who don't want to use jQuery. Now you actually have a mechanism for using with not a massively long word, a short word, and, <laughs> and something that actually has the correct semantics, which is great. Um, another one is document.parse, which I, uh, is not done yet, but I think we're getting close to having some consensus on it. Um, so here's a, uh, here's a example of something that you probably didn't think about until I just showed it to you. If you go, if you're like, oh, I have a string of HTML, which is a TD, and I want to like to make a node out of it, and you put it inside of a div, which is like the canonical way of just making nodes out of uh, strings, actually that does not work. Um, so it doesn't work because the browser's like, you cannot put a TR inside of a, or TD inside of a div. And this, basically this problem happens when you do this, right? So every single time you do this, jQuery looks at that, that string, and if we just did the naive solution, it would break. And you probably use this feature a lot in jQuery. Um, this is not the jQuery solution, but something like this is the solution. Go look for TDs. If you see a TD, go actually make a new string, which is the concatenation of a bunch of stuff, and insert that into a div. This actually sucks. This is a terrible, terrible thing. Um, if you look inside of jQuery, you'll see that we have a wrap map which basically knows for every single weird element how, what you have to wrap it in. This is like incredibly horrible. Um, but there's actually no way around it. There's no way to avoid this problem. And what we actually want is fragment equals document.parse. I, ha I could have had a slide which lists all the problems, but there's basically a, lar a large series of problems, including things like there is a A tag in SVG. If you see an A tag, what do you do? So like things you probably didn't think of, and it's very easy for us to be like, oh, SVG is a stupid idea, like kill it, kill it. Like no, we actually can't, right? We have to actually make this work in the browser. Um, there's also like script tags in SVG. There's a, and believe it or not, MathML came up as a thing. So um, when you actually start to look at how to do this without like a regex, right? jQuery uses a regex. It works fine for our use cases. But then you have to actually standardize what exactly it, it means and in, in fact, we want a standard. We want a thing that actually describes exactly what the behavior is in all cases. Um, so we're actually working through this right now, trying to get this in. I think, again, I think there's some consensus. You can see, uh, interestingly, the vector for getting this feature in. So I've wanted this feature for a long time. The vector for getting this feature in is that there's, a, there's an interest in having a template element. And a template element obviously cannot disallow a TR tag inside of the template, because that would be massively unexpected. So we needed to define, um, we needed to define a parsing mode anyway that would support this, and I said, hey, while we're at it, why don't we just finally implement this feature? Um, and now, you, so you can see like template element, parser changes, implied context, and again, we're working our way through. We started in May, we're now in mid-June. Um, it's working okay. Uh, process is working. So um, I think the important question is if you say, who are these W3C guys? Cri we have a crisis of confidence in them. Um, you have to ask yourself, like, who, is the, who are the people that are making the consensus? Who, who are the people who are responsible for making these decisions? And why, why are we not in there? Why are we not there? Um, so again, there's that, that quote from that uh, blog post, standards committees should not be the ones who get to decide to invent the future. Standards committees are not some weird, distant thing. Why are we not them? Why are we not the ones inventing the future? The process is actually built for us to do that. So why don't we do that? Um, I want to close with a quote from uh, Hillel, actually. He said, if I am not for myself, then who will be for me? And if I am only for myself, then what am I? And if not, now when? I think uh, we're finally getting to the point where the cutting edge is pulling away and the tail end is shrinking, and now is the right time. Now is the right time for us to get in. The future is coming. Let us be part of it. Thank you very much. I think I have time for a few questions. Like one or two, but we're gonna, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna skip the break that's gonna happen right now so that we can stay more or less on schedule. That doesn't mean you can't leave the room, but I mean, Nern's talking next, so why would you do that? Uh, so, one question, two questions? Maybe like a question with a simple answer, like what's your middle name? Uh, <laughs> you might not be able to pronounce it. <laughs> So, so um, my company is having a 
issue with a custom selector that somebody has put in. And uh, I was wondering how jQuery responds to having custom selectors, what they're doing to improve the acceptance of uh, custom selectors that aren't standard. Um, I can, I'm not exactly sure what the question is, but I can answer questions about custom selectors and standards. I'll say a thing and you'll tell me if I answer your question. Um, so one of the things that I've been working on recently is a big document that basically says why sizzle is not the same thing as query selector all. Um, and the reason for that is that I think from the spec author's perspective, it's like, oh, sizzle, it's a selector engine. Like that's basically query selector all, right? Uh, and actually it's not really. And so um, custom selectors are actually one such thing, right? You can't just replace sizzle with query selector all because there's no custom selector. So um, I've been working on a, bun a bunch of proposals for things like aliases, um, that might allow us to have, not in CSS proper, but just in the selector subset uh, or superset, might let us have a way to say, okay, colon text is the same thing as input type equals text. Um, and basically jQuery would register a bunch of these aliases and possibly raw JavaScript ones. Uh, maybe we can get positional selectors in, right? There's, there's, a bunch of, there's a bunch of things we would have to do to make QSA p as powerful as jQuery selector engine. Um, and I'm actually working on that. That's one of the projects that I worked on. So, there's basically three major projects other that are not part of JavaScript, which are the two I talked about so far, and the QSA, why is QSA not the same thing, or find all, I guess, now. Why is find all not the same thing as, um, as sizzle? And hope if I am successful, and again, these things take time, they're complicated, uh, we will be able to basically replace sizzle in some next generation of browsers with a bunch of registration of things that are for custom stuff.